The second thing that occurs to you is that we tend to think, looking backwards, that everything was inevitable. But if you trace the history from the beginning forwards, you see how chancy it all was, a whole set of accidents. It's as if the snow was falling on the mountain and some settled and some didn't settle. And so it's been a process of random variations and then a few things have been selected out and kept. And history, particularly in the last thousands of years, you can see that it's a whole lot of chances which have come together and there was no necessity. It might well not have happened. In fact, most people thought it wouldn't happen and yet here we are with the modern world. So those are the two things one thinks of immediately. So in terms of the future, what, what and looking back at the past in terms of what we can learn, what, what are your predictions? If I were asked what I predicted about the future from having studied the last 10,000 years of history, I would be very cautious because most predictions are wrong. But two kinds of guesses could be made. One is that really mankind hasn't changed very much. Nearly all of his history or her history has been hunting and gathering. And that's not just the first very long period of hunting and gathering. But after having gone through the agricultural period, which was most of civilized uh, history, just the last 200 years of industrial civilization in many ways is a return to hunting and gathering. If you look at, even at a great city like Chicago or London or Tokyo, you'll find that people act and look like hunters and gatherers in many ways. They rush around skimming off, not off nature now, but off machinery, the surpluses. They don't have to work with their bodies in the hard way that agricultural peoples had to work. Their kinship systems are usually very contracted and indeed the terminology for the kinship system of America and Europe is taken from a hunting gathering group. They marry on the impulse of love, they don't have much equality, uh, inequality and so you have a sort of social structure and a way of life which although it is technologically much more sophisticated reminds one very much of desert hunters and gatherers. So in some ways it's been a sandwich history with the, the bread at the beginning and the bread at the end, hunting and gathering. So not much has changed and our basic nature hasn't changed much in the last 100,000 years as far as we can see. But in another way you can say that everything has changed. And that's because the first 100,000 years of Homo sapiens has been a very slow evolutionary process, just like these mountains forming over hundreds of millions of years being pushed up by great forces. So humankind has been pushed by the great forces of evolution which work very slowly. But mankind has evolved slowly, him or herself, but through the manipulation of other species he or she has domesticated animals and plants and modified their genetic systems. And that has been the history of the development of agriculture and then he or she has modified their machinery and made the Industrial Revolution. What makes one think that there we may now be at a great turning point is that in the last 50 years, having, as many think, selfishly manipulated every species on this earth to our advantage, turned them into our own slaves, suddenly we've turned this process on ourselves. We now have turned the mirror of evolutionary adaptation on ourselves and we are modifying our own genetic structures through the discovery of DNA. So we can speed up our own evolution, select what we want. And so from Homo sapiens, there may be developing very soon, if not already, a new species which will replace us as we replace the Neanderthals, a species which I call Homo artificialis, artificial man. That is that it's made. Artifacts means to construct. It's constructed mankind. We construct it, we reconstruct ourselves in a new image. We make ourselves into more intelligent, healthier, whatever we like kind of beings, but we're no longer the product of unguided evolution as Homo sapiens was. And we also construct ourselves in another way because the development of artificial intelligence and thinking machines means that we can reconstruct our most human asset, which is the mind, and we can not only perhaps externally have computers, but in the future you might have computer implants, chips to translate languages or whatever in your mind. 
we already have artificial hearts and artificial limbs. So we may, may become a hybrid species between machine and mankind and have modified our genome so much that in another 10,000 years when someone sits here looking at the Himalayas, which will probably be unchanged, it'll be a very different kind of person sitting here and saying a very different kind of thing. <laughs> The story of the Garden of Eden and the loss of innocence is often taken to be the story of the loss of hunting and gathering. Adam and Eve picked the plants, uh, picked the fruits off the trees and lived a simple life without raiment and so on. And that was the life of hunters and gatherers. The fall of man, many people believe, is this long period when you had to work harder to gain a living. And so in many ways the superabundance that machinery produces for at least a few parts of the world is in some ways a return for those fortunate few to a sort of Eden. Can we do that again?